Here's the deal. We're in this interesting space that has this large pillar in between it. We are going to be presenting, hopefully not to the pillar, so we'll probably be focusing on this side of the room, but know that we're going to be projecting a film on that side of the room. So like, I don't know, be mobile. Yeah, I kind of love the idea of everyone getting up and like running to the other side of the room. <laughs> Awkward, yet probably necessary. But we'll give you the heads up when that's going to happen. Not yet, not yet. Unless you want to be over there, and then I'll present to the empty side of the room. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll just kick this off because we don't want to uh, butt up uh, against the next session too badly. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to a discussion of the We Save Two Film workshop, which was conducted over three Saturdays this past November. My name is Elena Rossi Snook. I'm the collection manager of the Reserve Film and Video Collection of the New York Public Library. And I'm here with Alex Whalen, who is the Film Collection Technician at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Hello. So, um, all right, we had this goal, which was to create an integrative curriculum which addresses current concerns across multiple fields of interest, uh, or and interest. So about three years ago, as an EMEA person, as a film advocacy task force person, I sat down with uh, Kodak and Oro and Ferrania to talk about what it would take to sustain the film manufacturing industry. And what we determined was that we need to grow more film users. Um, so that kind of sat in the back of my consciousness. Also, we wanted to address in this curriculum inclusion, right? Who has a voice and gets to make decisions in Hollywood, in film studies, and in archives? Because we couldn't just stop there, we're also like, could we possibly incorporate curricular STEM goals? Uh, for those of you who don't have kids or aren't parents, uh, STEM is science, technology, engineering, mathematics, it's a big deal right now. 
Um, so art making wasn't really a goal. In fact, I believe my exact words were keep this as far away from the art department as possible. And art therapy was definitely not a goal. Uh, so to create a curriculum, a number of things needed to happen, starting with money. And um, luckily, this kind of kicked off as all these things were percolating. Um, the New York Public Library announced that it would be hosting an innovation project funded generously by the Charles H. Russell Foundation that was inward facing. So you come up with a proposal, the New York Public Library colleagues vote on it, and um, you know, then you get funded. So I made a big push, we got funded, and uh, then we were able to start putting these things into action. I reached out to my um, peers at New York Public Library who worked in the education department, especially this guy, Zach Margolis, who worked in the out of school time area and had a background in uh, grammar school education as a teacher. We are super lucky in New York to have this guy. Uh, this is Steve Kaufman, who runs Mano No Aware, which exists solely to educate people on filmmaking and also film processing using a variety of mixes, but um, Coffinol is one of them. That's what we used. It's a coffee and vitamin C powder, non-toxic mix. So I reached out to them. Um, spent a lot of time thinking and talking about who this was for. I was really specific that I wanted a certain kind of kid. Uh, we realized it wasn't in our wheelhouse out of the gate to go for at-risk youth, but I wanted kids who were, who were under-resourced, and that could take on a number of forms. Um, and so I partnered with, this is uh, middle school number 250 on 96th Street and West End Avenue, and on the left is Principal Novella Bailey, and I made it really clear that I wanted a very specific kind of kid. She pointed out we also need families that are gonna be willing to make sure their kid comes on three successive <laughs> Saturdays. Um, so uh, that was a really good partnership, and, and she did hand select the kids based on our goals. All right, so what we came up with when we sat down across a number of meetings was uh, that the curriculum would include classroom time, screening and analyzing 16 millimeter works from the New York Public Library's collection, handling a print, Whole Foods. I was like, oh my gosh, we gotta feed the kids because we're gonna have them for six hours. And you know, I didn't wanna do McDonald's, I didn't wanna do pizza. I was like, if we're gonna be teaching them, I don't know, this, I just had this thing about like holistics. You know, like let's just make everything really healthy from the stuff we're teaching them to what they're putting in their bodies. Uh, shooting a test neg and seeing it being developed in the classroom using half and all. Visits and instruction from members of New York Women in Film and Television. I believe my exact words were, if only New York had an organization for women in film and television. Oh my God, there is. So that was an easy call to make. Uh, and the kids would work in groups, small groups, to shoot three minute 16 millimeter films, so like one daylight school per group. And then, because it was like an Amir project, I was like, how do you get the archiving teach in this? Like, can we do it? Yes, we can, because the films would then be accessioned and archived by NYPL. So um, from this uh, primary foundation, I arranged assistance from AMIA. We have this really cool thing, if you don't know about it, you can apply for a special funding project and uh, up to $500, and that gets approved by the board, and the board was like, yeah, we'll totally feed these kids. And also they bought us drives and, and gave us last year's leftover tote bags so the kids could get like their projects on a drive with some other cool swag. Kids love swag, everyone loves swag. Um, Kodak donated the film stock. That's an easy yes for them. They've got film stock to give. And I think even Jack Rizzo, who's a member here, I think Steve might have tapped Jack to do the scans and uh, get digital files for the principal, for the kids. Now to give you the backstory on how we approach this endeavor, because it's important I think to know where we came from to understand where we wanted to go. As it turns out, Alex and I were both Montessori kids. And uh, that means that Alex went to a school called Crystal Lake. I went to a school called Mountain Road. <laughs> and if you're not familiar with Montessori education, this is a dude in a field banging on a bongo drum while children frolic about him. That pretty much says it all. Um, I was also especially, or maybe especially me, I was informed by the narrative films of the 80s and 90s, so Stand and Deliver, 
dangerous minds, which I will say, I did not want to be, have this be a Michelle Pfeiffer dynamic. Like, I did not want to be Michelle Pfeiffer. This movie made me a little uncomfortable, you know. And this lady. So this is my mom. She was a teacher in a school that was on the grounds of a facility for boys sent through the family courts. And she taught English and humanities for almost 40 years. And I spent a lot of time in the classroom um, with her. And then I was a substitute teacher there. So I, I did see firsthand the impact of like Shakespeare on incarcerated youth. And it was a good impact. It was a positive one. Uh, there's also this guy in New York, Roger Larson. He, in the 60s, set up this thing called the Young Filmmakers Foundation. And he had an art background. But he also got his master's degree in social work. And so he thought about film being art therapy, an extension of his social work background. Uh, and so he set up shop, and he had lots of different kinds of kids come through Young Filmmakers Foundation, but mostly what he's known for is his outreach to the at-risk youth, right? And, and kind of the microcosm of this is this kid, Alfonso Sanchez, high school dropout, um, disenfranchised youth, made really beautiful, uh, provocative films on his own terms, thanks to Young Filmmakers Foundation. So Roger empowered these kids to create, and, and actually Roger had like a Montessori education background too. So kind of, it's, it's all about youth-led education. Like you wanna make a film about the experience of being high? Fantastic, you go do that. All right, so we went into this really idealistic, like OMG, we are going to like totally rock these kids' world, and what we got, was the kids from Risky Business. <laughs> I think the first question out of the gate was, will this make money? <laughs> we showed them Sour Death Balls, Jessica's used 90s project for UCLA, really charming. Uh, the question there was, or the comment was, this is not a commercially viable film. <laughs> One kid uh, was checking her eBay account halfway through the afternoon and announced, I made $300. They refused any suggestion of using media as a political or social voice piece. I, because I come from a 16 millimeter collection, was like, you guys, like, you're not empowered to say something. And they look at me, and the two girls were like, oh, we're not political. And then they wrote a story about throwing acid in a girl's face. Uh, they did not care about their films being archived at NYPL. I believe it was like, blink, blink, crickets. Oh no, one kid said, oh, I'm going to burn it all. Uh, so at the end of day one, I was in tears, like literally. I was just like, this is terrible. I wanted to name this session, um, We Save to Film the New Sociopaths. Alex is not okay with that. Uh, but I went up to the principal and I was like, how do you leverage education? They have their own money. They have their own media. They have their own social path platform. They don't need us and our media to do that for them. So how do you leverage education? So we realigned our expectations and came up with, well, at least it was six hours without video games. <laughs> but in the service of education, you need to be willing to take responsibility for the failure to engage. There are no bad kids, only bad lesson plans. We had to review and rework the curriculum. So I called the people who I knew would lead us in the right direction. I call my mommy. I was like, Mom, like, how do I address the disruptive behavior? Because we had kids who were like sneaking out with the teacher's chair to like race it up and down the hallway. Um, so I got her input on that, her guidance. I called Roger, who's in his 80s, still super, super lucid. And he gave me really great advice on how to deal with or address the violent storylines. And uh, we took it from there. Yeah, so. <laughs> In, in the thick of it a little bit at this point. So cut to day two, um, the second weekend, and the first thing we wanted to make sure to do was to remind them that it's their experience, not ours. So we said, all right, everyone, you don't have to be here. It's a Saturday. If you want to leave, let us know. We'll call your parents. We'll wait for them to pick you up. No one did, but from there, we sort of had to make sure to validate every element of the fact that they were there. So we validated their stories as theirs, um, to quote what Roger told Elena, Violet, marvelous, um, in regards to the acid in the face. Um, we wanted to make sure to have the mono educators prepare, prepare to work more directly with the problem kids and actually plan out film sequencing using worksheets, which they stopped to. 
Um, we ask them to plan questions about shock composition in advance for the visiting NIWIF professional, who on this second weekend was actually ATP. Um, we, at all costs, protected the outdoor filming time. We said, you're going to have this to, be, you know, three hours to do whatever you want to make your production, and we stuck to it. Um, and we also planned for a film screening at the very end, just in case they finished early, because our mantra by this point was no unstructured downtime. Ever. Ever, really. <laughs> um, but, interestingly enough, the most important moment came when the kids saw the results of their test rules. So they had shot you know, the negative test rule the week before, processed it, and then we had a positive for them the next weekend, and they could not believe what they had done. They, they were so shocked that they had actually used bolexes to create this sort of moving image. It, it honestly was like 1895 again. <laughs> it was like, people were so impressed by it. Um, and so the results from here become that the kids kind of listen to the guest speaker after this. They wanted to actually, if, now that they knew it could look good, they wanted to make it look good. Um, they asked her about shots and creating emotion through framing. The kids, all the kids showed interest in shooting, working collaboratively and respecting their peers' strengths. Um, and along the way, it actually even met some of our goals, some of our STEM goals. So math, you know, things like calculating the length of a shot, um, rehearsing sometimes five, sometimes ten times, you know, because we laid it out for them. You're not going to be able to edit this. You know what it means, right? When you press record, it goes, ah, oh, okay. So they, you know, they, they took it to heart. Um, things like visual literacy, you know, how to use POV, how to use close-up shots to create an emotional connection with the viewer. Um, we, you know, out, seemingly out of nowhere, witnessed, you know, all the kids were exerting signs of leadership and social structuring, identifying their own strengths and each other's strengths and supporting those roles. Um, one particularly, you know, inspiring example of this was there was kind of a problematic boy. This, this was a problematic yeah, boy. Yeah, that, that's him. <laughs> um, he had been paired up with two girls and was kind of mouthing off, not really respecting him in the classroom, but by the time they got out here, you know, he, he kind of said, well, this is not my project, but he respected the fact that they wanted to make something, and so held the camera for their shots, and, you know, could press record, that kind of thing. So they were supporting each other. Um, you know, elements of science, understanding exposure using the light meter. There was actually one kid who um, we somewhat uh, off the record would say is ADHD probably, um, and the light meter in particular really focused him. There was something about the sort of specifics of the numbers and the repeatable action that really he engaged every time saying, you know, I want to, I want to measure this shot, <laughs> which is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, but most importantly, we had kids acting like kids again. And so they were running around, playing, screaming, having so much fun, this is so great. Um, and so ultimately, it was not just how did we align the lesson plan or the resources we introduced, but it was really an instance of the medium as the message, which we agree is rich coming from the Film Advocacy Task Force, um, but there's just no other conclusion. I mean, the kids were consumed in their roles as director, light meter reader, rehearsing actors, but they were also so thrilled just to be making something. And so, you know, walking back to the school, the kids go, wait, so how are we gonna see these? And we go, well, you know, come to the library next week. And they go, how long will they be there? And we go, we told you this forever. They'll be there forever. And then they no longer want to burn them. Um, so that kind of brought us to the last component, and then we'll actually show you one of the films. Um, so the third weekend is just, you know, we invited all the kids to invite their friends, their classmates, their parents down to the Performing Arts Library. For about an hour, we um, rolled each film in sort of film festival style and had the kids who had worked on that particular film come up, talk about their processes. Um, and we were kind of like, well, it's been a week. I mean, will they even remember what they did? But they did. You know, they were totally willing to reflect on the impacts of their work on the audience, um, open to both feedback and criticism, in some cases, you know, healthy criticism from their peers. Um, and then, of course, you know, our after school special really came to light when the two kids on the left, we observed them, you know, they kind of looked at each other at the end of it and said, it's really good working with you, man. There was and, a handshake. Yeah, there was a handshake. And just to give you a little bit of clarity here, you know, the kid on the left is kind of the, the quiet, cool kid, didn't say much, but was totally always in control. The kid on the right, freely told me on the first weekend, well, I'm the weird kid, so I guess I should just work alone. And 
the fact that they actually made something together, in a way, and it's cheesy to say, but in a way, created togetherness. So take that for what you will. Um, so now if you want to move over to this side of the room real quick, we've got a three minute film. waiting for the streaming guy to get rid of it. So we kind of wanted to throw it to you and see if there are any questions. Um, I know there's a, there's a lot of elements to this, so we're also happy to talk in the hall or talk later. Um, we've got some reflection that we could offer your way. Um, so let's start it with you guys. Yeah. Why don't we just kick it off with Q&A? What okay. was the uh, class size and how many groups were there? We had, uh, we started off with 10 kids um, and one dropped she got sick. We had a, a cold thing kind of rip through New York. So we ended up with three groups of three. It was very, I will say right up, like right away, it was very resource rich. We had two adults for every group of three um, in the field shooting. In the classroom, in addition, we had the principal there. And, and that was intentional. I wasn't like, oh my god, like we're spending so much money and human resource on these kids. It was like, no, 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 that's what we wanted. Like the one kid who had ADHD, he would like 
these, oh my God, he, he envisioned this like Hitchcock shot. And I was like, oh my God, it's the shot from Vertigo. He doesn't know it's the shot from Vertigo, but it's the shot from Vertigo. And he would always be thinking, I was like, I feel for you, kid. Like, I know what that's like. But he would burn out after like two hours, and he just needed to go in the corner and read a book. And, and the, even the Mono no Omari instructor, who I was like, oh, I'm getting this chick's name, she knew how to stay with him and transition with him and then bring him back. So the whole point was to, to make sure this was resource rich. And, and it cost $3,000. I'll, I'll put that right out there. That was our budget. Actually, $3,600 because it was $3,000, which I, that was the innovation grant. I was like, I'm not, I just asked Steve, like, Steve, can you do this for three grand? He's like, yeah, totally. So that's what we did. And then another 600 from Amia, um, Olivia from the Film Advocacy Task Force helped arrange the catering. Um, so that's what it cost. Um, anybody else? Are you in the back? Uh, do you have any readings that you would recommend for working with students at the level that you did in a healthy way you were talking about? Well, it's, yeah, we do. So I think this is a good point to bring up that like we wanted to take this in a new direction. We're like, we have this new workshop for a new era with these new concerns, right? And like, it wasn't a filmmaking workshop, right? It was like a personal discovery workshop. No, like we ended up teaching a film workshop from 1964, you know? And that's where we were like, oh my God, the medium is the message. Like we don't need, it's, it's everything else is a soft sell. Like we filled the classroom with like women and non-white women. And that was like, okay, they're just going to have to absorb that on, on a, I don't know, subconscious level because it really was all about making a film. Um, that being said, all of the readings I can recommend are from like 1964. <laughs> so Roger Larson, uh, he wrote uh, Young Filmmakers. It's on, available on uh, Amazon and Alibris. And Young Animators was the follow-up. There's also, he had a guide. Uh, we have a PDF of the guide. I don't know if it's still in publication, but it was literally called like, a teacher's guide for working with film or something like that. Um, so anything, I mean, that's always been my shtick. Like, I don't like reinventing the wheel. And this isn't my wheelhouse anyways. You know, I like professionals who know what they're doing, who've invested a lot of time and energy in doing it right. So if it's a good program from 1964, then it's a good program now. So like, all of my, all of my stuff comes from old books, you know? So I can work on putting together a bibliography, or actually, by I, I mean my next Ryerson mentor and Isaac. <laughs> do, you, do you see this uh, happening again, selling it to, you know, kind of other groups to perform? I mean, what's the future? Okay, so therein lies the rub, because the kid who was the scary baby face killer, his parents actually work in the industry. Um, they make Adam Sandler films, which is like, oh, that's why you turned out the way you did. Um, <laughs> so his his dad like emailed me the next day. It was like, for the next one, like we'll get you funding for this. And everyone was like, like the parents were like, are you coming back by the end of the semester? Are you coming back with the same group? Are we going to do this again? What about the ninth graders? Like I was like, oh my god. So we had all these resources. For what? And Darren, like, we had the half an hour of like, hot oh, five, we did it. And then it was like, oh my God, I, I've had this like dream that won't go away that's like hanging out over here in its own bubble. I was like, there is that abandoned building on 97th Street. We could totally make it over like Ghostbusters and run this incredible nonprofit out of it. So I'm sure there's a gray area in between, but definitely, <laughs> definitely. I'm sure the start. I know. I've already been like getting people where I was like, hey, would you work for my nonprofit? We'll have a sequence, a montage sequence is up of us like renovating it and buying couches shaped like lips. <laughs> part, part of the conversation from the beginning, though, I mean, from the very first meeting was, let's make something that, although we live in New York and acknowledge the resources, Wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly, as unique and privileged in New York. We wanted to make something that fundamentally, be it curriculum or setup or just what, as much as we can, is scalable anywhere um, to anyone. So I think the idea is certainly that it is iterative. Um, and I think it's just a matter of, I mean, that's why it was even iterative for us. Like weekend one to weekend two, it completely retooled. But that, that was valuable in itself. So I think it's a matter of documenting that, um, making that accessible to people. We have to meet, we'll give ourselves the Christmas break off, and then we've got to meet to like integrate our notes, align, and, then, and then figure out with this community, yeah, I think passing it on as a module. And, and, and also not just to like, I know like Echo Park could totally do this, Colorado could totally do this, um, Chicago could totally do this. 
But part of me also really like upstate New York, like those kids, like it's one of the poorest regions in America. Like those kids desperately need something that's this intensive. So, do you know you had your hand up? Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, if, if you wanted any assistance sort of with branching out, um, then I would put you in touch with the Echo Park Film Center people because they sort of do a similar model and take it around the world. Wow. Like, I mean, they've gone to Thailand and Vietnam and, you know, so they, they sort of share that same belief um, and they, and they actually, they do have a nonprofit in a building and so, yeah. I mean, if, if you wanted to go yeah. down that road, I, I could. Cool. Uh, so we should, we should probably end it there just so um, John can set up for presentation. Um, but, okay. Yeah, we, got one one minute. Minute. we got one 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 minute. We got funded and in an actual workshop, I was like, no, 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 I know that the late 80s were like the height of funding for the humanities. Like there has to be like Google, 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 you, there, and I asked my mom, I was like, mom, you developed lesson plans. Like there were, there was like NISCA funding and, and NYSIT funding. Like you went to these like Chicago to workshop, like where did, all, where did all those go? Like I know that there was lots of funding to develop curriculum um, and I didn't get it answers that. So I, I'm sure that it's, like they're probably archived at the New York State Museum or someplace. But yeah, I'm sure that there are pre-existing resources out there. But no, nobody, nobody offered them up. Okay, now we do have to go. But we will be around and feel free to ask us, you know. Thank you.
So yeah, <laughs> I want to start off with a little story, and uh, it's a story that I think is really prevalent in um, our profession today, and it's also something I'm hoping to push back a little bit on, uh, and suggest that we should allow ourselves to be positive and uh, think about the solutions to problems that we may think are unsurmountable. And uh, that story is that when it comes to playback equipment, uh, legacy AV decks, and all the gear associated with preserving and archiving media were screwed, basically. Um, <laughs> and that old hardware is dying, that once all the gear is gone, our jobs are going to get much harder, if not impossible, to perform. Um, and I think like, the most articulate expression of that is um, this, this uh, article that Mike Casey was here to who's here, I don't know if he's here, but he's here, uh, um, wrote this article called The Gathering Storm. And um, the gist of it is on the slide, but uh, it's the idea that you know we're not going to have, there isn't time enough to uh, wait around because all the, the hardware is dying, and um, th there isn't enough time to digitize everything we currently have before everything starts failing. And there's some examples from that the article and the present the subsequent presentations like uh, you know there's a particular turntable that archives use where the main bearing is unavailable at any price. Sony uh, dab machine, um, there's a capstan motor that's unavailable at any price. There's audio alignment tapes used to calibrate open the machines. Uh, they're only made by one company and that um, the playback heads for that same format are also only made by one company. Uh, Sony, as many probably most of you know, doesn't manufacture HD cam tape anymore. Um, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's a dire situation, and you know, a lot of like respected people that I respect in the field have the same um, have echoed that sentiment. So all these things are worth reading in full. But the the basic idea is that preserving the format is inextricably linked to preserving the hardware, and that you can't have one without the other. The other thing I hear a lot is that it's harder to find stuff on eBay, <laughs> and it's everyone's like, you know, it used to be everyone archivist like go-to place to find stuff, and it seems to be like there's a scarcity now of, of equipment, or if you find it, it's for parts, or, um, you know, it's like sold as is and untested. So part of the conspiracy is, you know, a lot of these vendors are hoarding this gear so that we can it. Um, so when the storm comes, they'll be ready uh, to digitize anything we want them to. Um, this is also something I actually heard at a conference like a few months ago, and um, yeah, it's it's like I think like well, I think the sentiment speaks it speaks more to the excitement in the archives community about. 
taking software into our own hands, um, rather than the actual difficulty of hardware. But I think the point is that we've been pretty successful in building a community around open source tools uh, that help us manage digital files, for example. And I think this organization has done a particularly uh, great job in developing tools for archivists to help better manage files for long-term preservation and, and other kinds of things. But what I, what I would, the reason why I put this up here is because I want to um, advocate for the same kind of enthusiasm for open hardware projects. So let's change the conversation. Um, I, I would like to suggest, humbly suggest, uh, that we uh, abandon this idea that we're completely beholden to manufacturers and their whims that it's too difficult to understand how playback and capture work on a deep sort of mechanical level, and that it's just too expensive to maintain old equipment, and that hardware is um, you know, gonna fail and we're doomed. Because um, I think what we should talk about is uh, that it's fun to make stuff, and um, we should leverage our community of super smart people to help us make things, and that we're all working on shared problems when it comes to hardware and that when it comes to 3D printing, hardware, um, you know, it'll break, but you can just make it again. Uh, so just sort of like, let's think about this in terms of, um, well, the truth is, we might have a choice, but I can talk about that a little bit here. Um, yeah, and I don't, part of the inspiration behind this is that there's all sorts of crazy stuff happening in digital design and digital fabrication, and this is a show, I think it's still up with the Cooper Hewitt, um, but uh, you, uh, yours, Marmon, um, made a bunch of open source chairs. Uh, so they're these intricate, tiny pieces, and the chairs fit together, kind of like a puzzle. And you can download the source code online, you can print the chairs yourself. And um, what happened is he created this community of chair builders, people who have never made a chair before. And they posted their chairs online. They branched, you know, the original designs. They made their own chairs. They shared those chairs. They made kids' chairs. So all of a sudden, you have this whole community um, that had never made anything before, didn't know anything about chairs, and wanted to make some chairs. So um, I'm going to fly by this. I think. But basically, the idea is the buyer becomes the supplier. So I think that. Um, there's a lot of people now who think 3D printing is this like, we're in the beginning stages of a third industrial revolution. So we're very soon going to be at this point where everyone's just going to start making their own stuff. And um, it's, it's in the not too distant future. Um, and it's a fascinating thing that's happening right now. Um, if you haven't seen a, like, a desktop printer, this is like a very common one, I think still. Um, the way it works is you, you kind of have this filament the plastic, it looks like fishing wire, kind of. And um, it gets heated up and it's forced through an extruder. You feed your design into it and um, it makes a thing for you. Um, if you want to buy cost, you can buy one for as little as, I think, $250 now. Um, but the better ones obviously cost more money. So in terms of uh, AV archives, a lot of people are making stuff already. Uh, they may not call themselves archivists, but they're certainly making things. Um, these are just some examples I found on Thingverse, which is a, like a file sharing site where you can you know, swap your designs with people. There's some reels here. On the, in the middle on the right is um, someone built a um, 3D printed a rewind bench for film. Um, there's a splicing block there for 16 millimeter and that stuff. And on the bottom is just what the renderings look like in the software, in case you're curious. Um, so yeah, this is, these are pretty simple things, right? Um, there's obviously like more complicated projects. I think probably some of you are familiar with this. This has been going on for many, many years, but there was an NYU student named Matthew Hepler that built an entirely open source film scanner. And so everything from the source code to the hardware, the nuts and bolts, you can they're standard, you can buy on Amazon. Um, a lot of the parts are 3D printed. And there's a whole online community now that's discussing ways to make this better. They contribute to the code. They compare this with other high-end printers, just like other high-end scanners that um, you know, integrate with features. So 
there are really complicated things that are happening now in archive too. So yeah, I want to talk about a couple things I made, um, mostly to address a problem I had. So one of the things that we didn't have were slotless reels for audio, and um, I don't think they're made anymore, and I think they're hard to find. So if you don't know that the slot is like a little divot in the core, so you stick your tape in there and you, it's easier to wind, but it's really bad for long-term storage because it can create a bad pack and it can rip loud. And so it's better to have something without a slot. So what I did was I bought a $20 digital caliper on Amazon and I took a slotted reel that we had, an old one, and some graph paper and made a bunch of measurements. And then I, uh, I took out the slot, obviously. And then I um, designed um, a couple parts in, I think, Inkscape, which is like Adobe Illustrator, but it's free. Uh, and it's a vector graphic software. And I made three parts, a top and a bottom and a core, and some holes for some screws from an old MD uh, reel. And um, I had it printed. And that's what it looks like. Okay. <laughs> um, so I... <laughs> That was um, my first shot at making something. Uh, and then a, a more complicated project is this thing. Um, so yeah, this was supposed to solve another problem that we were having. Uh, we probably have about 30,000 optical discs in the collection, all masters, everything from audio CDs to DVDs to datas, data discs, um, you name it. And we had bought a commercial robot um, that a lot of archives use. Um, and I found it incredibly problematic. Uh, the software and the hardware are integrated. Um, there it's, the software is not um, optimized for archives. It doesn't do a lot of the things that we would want it to do. I could go into more detail about that. And also it broke frequently. So I had to keep sending it back to the one person that could fix it. And um, after a lot of that back and forth, I started to get frustrated because it wasn't doing the things I really wanted it to do in the first place. So my thought was like, well, we could build our own robot. Um, I started to look around, and um, there's a lot of um, interesting people on the internet uh, <laughs> that uh, make a lot of things sort of like this. Um, and I found one, and I kind of copied the idea and tweaked it a little bit. Um, there's obviously not a whole lot of documentation, but the one that I used to model the scepter had some okay documentation. Um, and what it does is uh, there's two trays for your discs, one the, the take-up tray and one is the, the eject tray. And there's an old Plex store drive from the mid-2000s in there, uh, which is a pretty good drive. And uh, so you put up to 20, in this version, you put up to 25 discs in one. You can load up to 25 discs at a time. This robot arm will uh, grab the discs load it, do a bunch of stuff to it, and then eject it from the other side. Um, this thing? Does anybody know what that is? That's the computer, yeah. That's the uh, Raspberry Pi, so that's the thing that's very cheap. And um, it's actually hooked into a laptop. So the Raspberry Pi is running the, the machine, and the laptop's running the software. But yeah, the close-up here is um, those are the printed parts, and uh, the black things are the servos, so that those are the, um, uh, the motors that move the arm up and down, the pincher, and stuff like that. So the idea is that you will have this fully open tool, I mean, aside from the drive, uh, that will allow you to set parameters for how gently you want the discs to be handled. Um, the coordinates, so if I wanted to load 50 disks instead of 25, I would just make, change the coordinates of the arm and then just make longer, um, you know, these things. <laughs> so they could hold more. Um, so it's, it's, you, it's you, can, you can kind of do whatever you want. And then, alternatively, I wanted to integrate a robot with a bunch of software so I could do error logging for audio CDs. Um, have a high amount of control on how fast the ripping was going, um, 
I could create ISOs of data disks. I could run software to rip DVDs at a certain specification. I could, you know, make access copies of certain things. That kind of stuff. So um, it is working, but it's not working great. So that's why I, I don't have a good people there. But um, <laughs> right, now, but it's it's you know we're getting there. Um, so yeah. Uh, I guess like a couple things. Um, these are things that I've learned uh, through the course of these projects and just kind of looking into things. Um, it's definitely like an iterative process. So if you have a part <coughs> or a piece in your archive that's broken and there's only one piece and you want to make a new one, you might have to make it like a bunch of times until you until it works. Um, it's just a design thing, basically a design principle. The other thing is you're making, you're remaking things that uh, were made maybe 40 years ago, and you may not want to make it the same way because the, the objective is not to make this like historic object, it's to make something that works. So just recognizing that um, 3D printing is a different kind of manufacturing process, and there's different things to consider like the material that you're using and its strength and its flexibility as opposed to like you know mold injection from the 70s or something like that. So you may be designing an entirely different part that's maybe even much simpler, um, but it serves the same purpose. So it's not just about copying something. Um, also, there's just tons of free stuff out there. Tinkercad is what I use for 3D printing. It's just an online free 3D software tool. It's kind of a lot like using Photoshop or something like that. Um, Inkscape is the vector graphic software, and then Thingverse is just like a, just one of many, many file sharing sites where people share their designs. And usually there's a Creative Commons license or something attached to it. So it's like, yeah, go for it. Um, oh, and the last couple things are mostly like the if you send this to something out to somebody who has a printer, if you don't have one, um, you just have to be aware that all printers are different. And so like these green parts are or reprints from a different machine because the gears are so, um, you know, they have to be so precise for the piece, pieces that fit together. You really need something that, that prints very accurately. So not all printers work the same. They're all, um, some are less expensive, but they don't work as well, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> and um, what else can I say? Um, yeah, it can take a really long time. So it's not like it's not like feeding a sheet of paper into like an inkjet printer. If you have a part, be prepared for like hours of waiting. Um, that's just something that some people don't realize. So if you're attached to the university, you may have a space where you can use the printers, or maybe like there's a maker space in your city. Um, but just be aware that like the time it takes, and also in those common shared spaces, those machines have a lot of wear and tear. So they may not be working as well as they did when they were brand new. So if you're making really intricate things, it's just something to be aware of. And uh, I guess just moving forward, part of the reason why I did all this stuff this year was because I wanted to bring the idea of making things into the conversation of our community. And so I just my thought was to just start something and then sort of try to get a bunch of people together and we can sort of decide where that's going to go. That was my idea. So some things I sort of thought about were that if we have a hack day next year, um, maybe a group of us could get together and talk about a common thing that we want to design and make, and maybe we could partner with some place in the city of Portland and make it and, and show everybody that at the end of the week. Um, we could maybe have some training sessions on um, how to use some of this stuff. Um, and maybe just creating a repo on, on, on the uh, open source so we can contribute and share design ideas. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a whole crazy world of makers out there that I was pretty unaware of. Um, and they're, they're doing a lot of things that we're also interested in. So it's, it's good to kind of reach outside and, and see that there's a lot of people working on this stuff um, that may not call themselves archivists. And uh, yeah, I'm just gonna see the time here. Great. You want to see that video? Yes. yes.
So yeah, so this is not my machine, but it's like a similar machine, so don't be too hard on me. Oh, these are the credits. That's the, that's the, um, the top link is the thing I copied. It's called Jack the Ripper Bot. Um,
So if you're just making a um, prototype, you can put like a little quality print, and that prints much faster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would just point out that like 3D printing, just be careful about printing it. And, uh, printing a machine. Printing a machine, just keeping Closed or vented. Oh, vented, yeah. Vented, yeah. Or, or, you know, because the, the, the people aren't talking about it, but, you know, <coughs> and, and uh, the plastics, they put up nanoparticles. Yeah. There's a study I think I saw online about that. Yeah, I took the 3D printer out and it gets like Yeah. And a lot of these plastics, I'm sure they're not like low VOC or, you know. But, but they don't like the yeah. Have you thought about using uh, tabletop CNC machines? Oh, the, the, the wood, like the milling machine? Well, it, like um, there's a, a machine called the Chicoco, uh -huh. and they sell it. It's kind of kit based, it comes in a couple of different sizes. Yeah. And, and it literally can sit on a big tabletop. Yeah. And it's very flexible, and you can use a variety of software to design parts and I think using something like that and you can get it for like three thousand dollars using one of those with uh, a 3D printer could give us some really nice options. Yeah I didn't get into too much but there's like a lot of different there's a lot of stuff out there. I mean for sure like there's this is this is one kind of 3D printing process. There's many kinds. There I mean, I saw someone I saw a desktop printer that prints metal now. I mean there's sorts of crazy stuff so I'm only really scratching the surface, but yeah, there's a lot of different things out there. Maker Fair is always worth it. Yeah. I, I had a question. What were you dissatisfied with that made you go this way? I want control. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, was the, what was the commercial device you were using? Uh, it was that the rip station. Uh, you know that uh, one? <laughs> <laughs> we're live streaming. <laughs> uh, one of the things I wanted was to, for audio CDs, I wanted to get um, C1, C2, and CU error reports. So I went to log how many uncorrectable, un, how many uncorrectable errors there were in the screen. Um, so that kind of functionality, like, and then I wanted to set parameters where, like, if the CD, after running these forensics kind of tools, reached a certain threshold, I wanted the machine to tell me and then to eject the disk. So part of the reason was with a batch of tens of thousands of CDs, I wanted to see like a quick, quickish way if there was a way that I could plot a trend in terms of like errors over time based on the age of the disk. And so those kinds of like robust like forensics type tools is not really something that that, that thing is made for. Um, the other thing I should say it was it was there were some mechanical problems with it. It just after getting so much of it, it would kind of just break it down. And it's not like, so my, my like idea with this is like, I could, if this broke, I could just put it in the car. I mean, in theory. Um, all right. All right.